In recent months, there has been a big focus in the US on this thing called critical race theory, and especially about whether it's being taught, and indeed whether it should be taught, in schools. And the same debate is happening in the UK, or at least it's starting to emerge. What's it all about? Is it really a problem? Well, let's take a look. Furious debates have exploded into full view in the United States over the teaching of critical race theory in schools. Most colourful have been the protests in Loudoun County, where speeches against the perversion of children's education have gone viral. Scott Minio, one of the founders of Parents Against Critical Race Theory, said it's anti-white. It takes a negative position against the United States. And there are some who say that the same conflict is on its way to the UK. US pollster Frank Luntz told the Times of London, I'm seeing things that you are going to see six months to a year from now. It's already done significant damage to our system in the United States. It prioritises equality over meritocracy. We're becoming intolerant of tolerance. Some are saying it's already well advanced over here. This week, the Free Speech Union submitted a dossier to the Department for Education documenting instances of what it described as ideological indoctrination in 15 English schools. In the UK, teachers have a legal duty to avoid promoting partisan political views in classrooms, but the Free Speech Union said that it found evidence that this is routinely being ignored and ignored with the encouragement of the National Education Union, Britain's largest teaching union, which recently published a report saying schools are shaped by colonialism and there is an urgent need to decolonise every subject and educate children about white privilege and anti-racism. So what is this thing called critical race theory that has become the focus for campaigners on the right in the US? Let's start with what its critics say about it. Christopher Rufo, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a conservative think tank, defines critical race theory as an academic discipline built on the intellectual framework of identity-based Marxism. And he said this, its supporters deploy a series of euphemisms to describe critical race theory, including equity, social justice and diversity and inclusion. Critical race theorists realise that neo-Marxism would be a hard sell. Equity, on the other hand, sounds non-threatening and is easily confused with the American principle of equality. US Representative Jim Banks said that critical race theory teaches what he described as racial essentialism, that American institutions are racist and need to be destroyed from the ground up. So that's the headline Republican critique. Now, as you might expect, Democrats don't agree with that take, and they've increasingly started hitting back against the attacks. One thing they say is that the Republicans are misrepresenting a respectable academic theory. They're simply fear-mongering that kids are being taught to be racist, and that ultimately what Republicans don't like is being made to focus on inequality at all. Kimberley Crenshaw, a law professor and central figure in critical race theory, said this, Critical race theory just says let's pay attention to what has happened in this country and how what has happened in this country is continuing to create differential outcomes. Critical race theory is more patriotic than those who are opposed to it because we believe in the promises of equality. And we know we can't get there if we can't confront and talk honestly about inequality. You may note with interest that the words of a professor in defence of the academic theory sounds quite a bit like activism. And that's at the root of the issue, of course, because rightly or wrongly, this is an academic theory that seeks to shape the world. So it's anything but strictly an academic debate. And if Republicans say that it's about neo-Marxism, it's that focus on equality of outcomes rather than equality of opportunity, which is what they point out. So what do the academics who are actually involved in this thing say about what it's really about? If the Republicans have got it wrong, what are they missing? Critical race theory is more than 40 years old. It holds that race is a social construct and that racism is not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice, but something embedded in legal systems and policies. 
According to early CRT scholar Angela Harris, the critical part of critical race theory means to be radical, to locate problems not at the surface of doctrine, but in the deep structure of American law and culture. There are a number of tenets that are often identified as being associated with the academic version of critical race theory. So one, as already mentioned, is that race is a social construct. It's a product of human interaction, was historically created to justify and maintain social hierarchy, slavery and other forms of exploitation. Two, intersectionality. Race is inextricably linked with other groupings of privilege and disadvantage, such as class, gender, sexuality, and so on. Three, racism is endemic to America and its institutions. American law, government, politics, religion, and so on are all founded on it. Four, CRT rejects attempts at race neutrality, objectivity, or colour blindness and meritocracy in public policy. If you aim not to see race, then this will blind you to how all the institutions are working against people of colour. Five, racism is a structural phenomenon and it explains unequal outcomes. Six, CRT rejects liberalism's contention that racism is an aberration, a departure from the social norm rooted in prejudice, bias and stereotype. Liberal prescriptions for increased education, colour blindness and racial mixing are all doomed to fail because they ignore that racism is core to the system. Seven, racial progress is often ephemeral and always subordinate to the rest of traditional liberal priorities, such as individual freedom, freedom of association, free markets, property rights, and so on. And eight, critical race theory doesn't just stop with the theory. It aims to change the circumstances of marginalised people. In other words, it's a recipe for activism, not just study. The critical race theory defenders suggest that this academic understanding of critical race theory is substantively different to how the critics portray it. They say that it gets used as a general label for what people describe more broadly as wokeism and identity politics. A focus on group identity over universal shared traits, dividing people into oppressed and oppressor groups and urging intolerance. Stephen Sawchuk, writing on the Education Week website, said there is a good deal of confusion over what CRT means as well as the relationship to other terms like anti-racism and social justice with which it is often conflated. To an extent, the term critical race theory is now cited as the basis for all diversity and inclusion efforts regardless of how much it actually informed those programmes. It's an open question how much that distinction actually matters because it does seem that some of the key concepts of what may have started as an academic theory have become popularised into the national discourse. The elements that stand out from the academic list as being influential in the toolbox of modern day political activism would include the idea that racism is endemic to the system and the institutions, that people of colour are experts in their own experiences and their voices should be heard and not challenged, the focus on intersectionality, that you can build layers of oppression with the mix of different social group identities, and white people benefiting from racism whether or not they're conscious of it. So white privilege being a thing and it makes attempts at colour blindness part of a problem not as part of a solution. With that list marking out a fairly prominent part of recent discourse, it's not really clear that the exact academic purity of the discussion is that relevant. But people will also point to criticism of CRT over arguments that it patently doesn't make, such as the claim that it advocates discriminating against white people in order to achieve equity. Well, that may not be part of the academic origin of CRT, But the critics didn't make it up. It appears in the argument because of popular works that have built on the political narrative on top of CRT and then extended it. So, for instance, the writer Ibram X. Kendi, his best-selling book How to Be an Anti-Racist, argues that discrimination in the name of equity can be considered anti-racist along with Robin D'Angelo with her book on white fragility. These are the voices that have fed a lot of that popular debate on all of this. You can focus on the fact that neither of those authors is a critical race theorist in the academic sense. But it's not really the point. They have built on the activist element that's inherent to critical race theory, and they've turned it into something more immediate and more compelling. 
the argument that so long as more black people are poor, then the system is racist and that's why they're poor. Someone like Thomas Sewell may say that there are cultural issues among the black community and they would progress better if they embraced habits that had proven successful for other groups, such as Asians, with their focus on valuing education and a high work ethic. But the CRT activists say no, however hard those communities work, the system is holding them down, period. Republicans argue that such arguments rob people of agency. CRT activists say that their critics are victim-blaming and ignoring systemic oppression. Now, we can have an angry or a mature debate on such matters. There is a valid discussion to be had. But the key question that really raises the temperature, of course, is whether such statements should be taught at school. In education, we want children taught facts about the world and also taught what are the different ideas and theories that people argue about without being indoctrinated into any of them as being the truth. I mean, there's always some dispute about that, of course. Some will say, oh, it's evolution thing. That's not facts. Instead, creationism is the truth and so on and so on. And yeah, we do have to have those arguments because one side of that debate is wrong. Nevertheless, political ideologies should not be mixed up with education any more than religious versions of history should be. In recent months, a number of Republican states have been passing bills that propose to ban the teaching in schools of key concepts that they associate, rightly or wrongly, with critical race theory. These include one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex, an individual by virtue of the individual's race or sex is inherently privileged, racist, sexist or oppressive, whether consciously or subconsciously, an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment because of the individual's race or sex. An individual's moral character is determined by the individual's race or sex. An individual, by virtue of the individual's race or sex, bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. And an individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish or another form of psychological distress solely because of the individual's race or sex. You can see links in those two current arguments, but CRT activists say that they misrepresent what CRT puts forward. So in principle, that should be fine. I mean, if you're going to prohibit things that no one's currently teaching anyway, no harm done, everyone's happy. Except, of course, everyone's never happy. So is CRT actually being taught in schools? The answer to that, even from the defenders of CRT, isn't wholly coherent. On the one hand, you get academics saying, of course not. Law professor Gary Peller, for instance, said this. CRT is not a racialist ideology that declares all whites to be privileged oppressors, and CRT is not taught in public schools. He added, it's a complex critique that wouldn't fit easily into a K-12 curriculum. Even law students find the ideas challenging. His theory on what was happening was this. Conservative activists have branded all race reform efforts in education and employment as CRT, a disinformation campaign designed to rally disaffected middle and working class white people against progressive change. Again, that sounds rather like the language of a political campaigner, not the academic. And it's the blurring of that line that seems to be the point of all this. And that brings us to the contrasting position of the supporters. On the one hand, they say CRT isn't really being taught in schools, that's just right-wing misinformation. But then they immediately follow it up with the argument that it really should be taught in schools, at least in spirit. So, for instance, Pella goes on to say this. What's really under attack right now isn't the bogeyman of critical race theory, it's the modest and long overdue change being ushered in by teachers and school administrators. They may never have heard of CRT, but they intuitively understand why it exists and rightfully see the absurdity of a conservative charge that teaching about racism is itself racist. So teachers intuitively understand why CRT exists and in that spirit are moved to teach about racism. The fact that racism has existed and shaped US history in major ways, that's a point of fact, entirely appropriate for education. The idea that it's endemic to the system, that's a political opinion. Teaching people that it's one of those things that's the focus of political debate, that would be fine, particularly for older age groups. Teaching it as a fact, that surely does cross the line. 
as you would expect, where there are examples of educators egregiously going into the worst excesses, anti-CRT campaigners have been quick to amplify those. So the training course for Seattle public school educators that told them that the education system was guilty of spirit murder against black children and that white teachers must bankrupt their privilege to acknowledge their stolen inheritance. And the San Diego public schools accusing white teachers of being colonisers on stolen Native American land, telling them that they're racist and that they need to undertake anti-racism therapy. And plenty of others. But you should be aware that this is a thing that partisans on both sides will do. They will find the worst examples of behaviour on the other side, amplify it, and in so doing give the impression that it's commonplace and growing. Which, of course... It might be. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are clearly educators out there who have no qualms in introducing their own ideology into their educational curriculum. And don't think that only happens on one side. You just shouldn't take the words of partisans for it. Even the ones with integrity, because they will be pointing to real examples and they're really outraged about them, doesn't necessarily mean that they're representative examples. For example, both the instances I just mentioned were messages given to teachers. Bad messages, for sure, but we don't know whether the mere fact of that meant that that translated into the actual teaching of children in those schools. It could be that teachers just quietly shook their heads at the dumb training that public money was being wasted on, and they just carried on doing the common sense things they've been doing already. They might have. We don't know. But we can look at how this has unfolded in relation to an agreed curriculum. For instance, California's K-12 curriculum for ethnic studies. This was arrived at after years of divisive debate and guides how the histories, struggles and contributions of Asian, Black, Latino and Native Americans and the racism and marginalisation they've experienced in the United States will be taught to millions of students. In the process of shaping it, 100,000 public comments were offered and it was pulled back some way from its more radical first draft as a result. There are four themes for its model curriculum, identity, history and movement, systems of power and social movements and equity. It establishes a series of values, principles and outcomes for study, including these. Critique empire building in history and its relationship to white supremacy, racism and other forms of power and oppression. And... Connect ourselves to past and contemporary social movements that struggle for social justice and an equitable and democratic society and conceptualise, imagine and build new possibilities for a post-racist, post-systemic racism society that promotes collective narratives of transformative resistance, critical hope and radical healing. That doesn't sound just like teaching kids the realities of history. I mean, it does sound pretty ideologically fixated. When it was launched, Education Board President Linda Darling-Hammond certainly seemed to imply that this was an activist agenda. Ethnic studies demands that we understand the forces that stand in the way of our shared humanity so that we can address them. We need the more complete study of our history that ethnic studies provides and the attention to inequality that it stimulates. All of this has come to a head because of the responses by educators across the US following the death of George Floyd, in response to which some have expanded their curriculums in this area significantly. Some curriculums now include more racialised historical events, such as the Tulsa race riot, the Rodney King case and the subsequent Los Angeles riots. And from there to wider questions about race and white privilege. Jane Bolgatz, Associate Dean at Fordham University School of Education, said this, If we aren't talking about race, we aren't noticing the ways in which society pushes white people forward. And so then we're not noticing the fact that those wins are not only pushing them forward, but pushing people of colour backward. So again, some are saying CRT is not taught in schools, but clearly its basic principles are certainly being seen as desirable educational material by at least some of the teachers. But they do say this still doesn't fit the negative picture that some are painting. Bolgatz again. If a kid is being taught that they're an oppressor, that means that the person who's doing the teaching is not explaining the difference between people and systems. Racism is a system. People are prejudiced and we can work out our own individual prejudice, but we also have to work on the systems that discriminate writ large. 
It's a perfectly valid political point of view, but even noting the avoidance of blaming the child, is it to be taught as fact in schools? Why should we teach children? It's so that the children who are going to grow up and be doctors and teachers and police officers and judges have some understanding about what it means to be equitable, Bolgat said. Now, in my day, kids were taught not to discriminate, not to demean other people, basic values stuff. It's not exactly the same as being taught that the system is racist and all the rest of it. I mean, it's a good question. At what point do common values cross the line to become an ideological framework alien to the national story? That can be a tricky point of definition for sure. If Republicans want to teach children America is a land of opportunity for all, you could justify that. Plenty of examples from history. You could also argue that it's just as much of a projected ideal as the alternative. The difference is that at least one of those is in line with the founding principles of the country, while the other is cynical to those principles. Nations only exist on the basis of a shared story. Chanel Wilson, Assistant Professor of Education at Bryn Mawr College, said that CRT should be taught from a very young age. Ideally, we would teach children that people are different and that people's differences were used to separate and create hierarchy and as tools of power and inequity. It feels heavy, but children of colour already feel it. So it does seem to me that there's a significant gap between what she's describing there and teaching about history. People are not exaggerating if they point at that and describe it as political indoctrination. But that doesn't mean that you should take that further. English teacher Mike Stein said this about the new Republican law in Tennessee. History teachers cannot adequately teach about the Trail of Tears, the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement. English teachers will have to avoid teaching almost any text by an African-American author because many of them mention racism to various extents. While I can see the bills in question, that is a significant overstatement. If it isn't, then the bill should be amended because of course you should be able to teach those things. There's a difference between that and those other ideological curricula, though. And this is the political game. One side points to the worst excesses and uses them to justify a ban. The other side will exaggerate what they want to ban and point to the common sense realities they claim they will be prevented from teaching. So where does this leave us? The fact that there's a fundamental philosophical disagreement and it is being sharpened by political imperative. You could summarise the distinction by reference to a 2007 US Supreme Court case on race in schools where Chief Justice John Roberts famously said the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. But then in response to that, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, it's very hard for me to see how you can have a racial objective, but a non-racial means to get there. Right now, it seems that the well-publicised excesses and nonsense versions of the arguments have been taking a toll on public opinion. A recent poll on the teaching of critical race theory found that 61% do not believe students should be taught that America is structurally racist and is dominated by white supremacy. And there's no doubt that with the midterm elections in the near future, Republicans are seeing political opportunity in making a cause celebre out of opposition to CRT in schools. Hence, you shouldn't find it unusual or strange that politically active parents in wealthy Loudoun County, some of whom reportedly are professional Republican strategists, are leading the campaign against school board members there and making a very public noise about it. Now, by the way, noting that something's part of an organised political campaign doesn't necessarily mean that the issue it addresses isn't valid. You just should be aware it's not accidental, that it's getting the profile that it is. Democrats' attempts to dismiss it all as a right-wing conspiracy shows that to some extent they don't really quite know how to fight back because that's surely not a winning argument. Governor Terry McAuliffe, from, for instance, who dismissed it all as a political fabrication. This is totally made up by Donald Trump and Glenn Youngkin. This is who they are. It's a conspiracy theory. This villainization helps Republicans to circle their wagons around the errant idea that any attempt to discuss racism in classrooms is itself racist. This view is consistent with a fantastical view of US history in which America has entirely overcome its ugly, racially unjust history. Which is a remarkable argument that says, on the one hand, there's nothing to see here, 
while at the same time saying that it's good that there is something to see here. You might want to choose one of those two, being as they are kind of, you know, mutually incompatible. And that line just isn't going to work, because people are seeing enough examples of the nonsense in practice and amplifying reality, however representative it may or may not be, that is highly effective campaigning. And some on the Democrat side acknowledge the embarrassing realities. Critical race theorist David Theo Goldberg said this, It is true that anti-racism today has been turned into something of an industry. But diversity training, racial equity, systemic and institutional racism, and indeed anti-racism itself, are not the inventions of CRT. All but diversity training predate it. The foolishness sometimes said and done in its name, including some genuinely wince-worthy, is being used as a sledgehammer to bash any effort to discuss and remedy racial injustice. To be fair, Karl Marx would probably have been horrified at some of the nonsense said and done in his name as well. But, you know, systems do rather have to take responsibility for what behaviours they result in in the real world, what incentives and dynamics they create amongst their adherents. For all that its defenders protest, when you look closely at their defences, none of it seems to belie the fact that race and identity politics is being taught in an ideological manner and that there's a perfectly valid way to teach about race and the history of racism in the US without doing that. Republicans are jumping on this because it's real, because ordinary middle ground voters won't support the ideology of this kind being taught to their kids. There have been conspiracy theories aplenty in recent times. This really isn't one of them. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself.